Hello everyone, thank you so much for tuning in today. Before we get started, there are just a couple things I wanted to say. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, feedback, anything throughout the process of this video, please leave me some feedback in the comments section or in the form that I'll provide in the description. I'd love to hear from you. It's so great whenever people reach out to me and interact with me about what I've been posting, so please do that if you have something to say. Secondly, I just wanted to take a moment to thank Dr. Austin for taking the time to speak with me. He is such an inspiring educator. He has inspired me as a musician and a person. So I hope that what he has to say will inspire you guys as well. I really, Please take the time to listen to some of his messages. Use, as usual, use the video as you please. You can skip around, you can watch certain parts, however is going to help you learn. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you learned something. I'm Austin. I am the interim chair of the Department of Music at Virginia Commonwealth University, and I've been the director of bands for, this is my 35th year, I believe, there. Um, before I came here, I taught at the University of Missouri-St. Louis, and before that, I uh, did my doctorate. I taught at a, a high school in uh, Ohio. Before that, I did my master's at the University of Hawaii. And before that, I taught high school in Indiana. And then I started off at Indiana University. I did my bachelor's degree in um, music education. I played in, actually, I, I'm, I'm a trombone player, but I played euphonium. I went off um, to, at that time, I wanted to be the world's greatest high school marching band director. Most of my friends now would find that amusing. Um, actually, I got a call from my uh, my band director, Mr. Epps, and he said, hey, I think I've got a job for you. And uh, our the guy who had been our, my drum major my first two years at Indiana in the marching band had uh, opened a new school and he was getting ready to go back to graduate school. And so he, he said, uh, do you have anybody for the job? And Mr. Epps said, I do have somebody for the job. And he recommended me for it. And really before I even went up to interview for it, I'd been given the job. I, you can see there's a pattern of a lot of luck here. Uh, people just giving me things that I probably didn't deserve. The second year I was teaching, my uh, one of my college managers came to visit my marching band rehearsal and, and uh, put kind of a bug in my ear to start thinking about graduate school. And I, um, so I applied to graduate school at Butler University, which is about 50 miles away. And I started some graduate classes. In the meantime, I was also filling a sabbatical position at a local college. So I was a high school band director, a middle school band director, a college band director, and I was going to graduate school. And this is my second year of teaching. Um, and out of all those things, I was enjoying everything enormously, but I got really interested in graduate school. So I decided to go full time. So I started looking for assistantships. And again, I went to my college band director, another theme. And, um, he said, there's an assistantship at the University of Hawaii. Would you be interested in doing that? And I, I wasn't sure, really, but um, I applied for it. And um, the, the director of bands at, at the University of Hawaii just happened to be visiting Indiana University just a few weeks later. And because of where he is, I mean, or was at the time, there was no way he ever got to interview his teaching assistants. So he was thrilled to actually have a, a chance to interview somebody face to face. And so I interviewed with him got along really well. He offered me the job. I went back and um, uh, long story, but I eventually I told my superintendent that I would be leaving and uh, I never got any word from the University of Hawaii that I'd been accepted or given an assist teaching assistantship. And I was beginning to get worried since I'd already resigned my job and I called to find out what was going on. And he said, oh, oh, I think I forgot to tell everybody here. And so he, he took care of it and I, I got a letter, we did letters in those days, and I moved to the University of Hawaii for two years and it was a wonderful experience um, because so many people pass through there. There's so many opportunities to work with students and, and musicians from all over the world. Anyway, when I left, when I left Hawaii, uh, finding a job was actually very difficult because I was so far away, but I eventually found a job in Northern Ohio, just outside Cleveland. And I, I did that job for three years. Um, in many ways, that was the hardest job for me uh, because Unlike the first job I was in, these students had everything and they felt very entitled and um, 
it was relatively difficult to get anything done. And the band culture there was really, really weak. And we had to overcome a lot of stigmas to get anything done. And um, I went to the University of Wisconsin, spent three years getting my doctorate and had a wonderful experience there. Um, um, too many stories to tell, don't want to do, do all that. And then I got a, um, my first college teaching job was at the uh, University of Missouri, St. Louis. I had visited Richmond, so I applied for the job, didn't hear a thing for about six, eight weeks. And one day I just got a call saying, hey, this is so-and-so from Virginia Commonwealth University. Are you still interested in this job? I said, well, I don't know, tell me about it. And so he did. And I ended up coming here to interview. Uh, and when I came here, I decided this is the place I want to stay. This is the place I want to try to build something. It's a place I want to try to make a difference. I wanted to stay here and I've never regretted it. I've had a really wonderful experience here. Um, and I've been able to accomplish much more, much more than I ever really would have anticipated. I think that the dynamic of a very advanced band is a little bit misunderstood. So could you speak to um, just kind of the balance of musicality and personality in a wind ensemble and how that operates? Well, I think first of all, there's a there's kind of a mindset that you have to develop in an ensemble, and that is that you don't come to a rehearsal to learn your parts. You know, if that were the case, the Marine Band would never rehearse. If that were the case, the Richmond Symphony would never have to rehearse They because they know their parts. They know they can play their parts perfectly before they ever come to the first rehearsal. If that were the goal, professional ensembles would just show up and do concerts. The goal in a rehearsal is to get everyone to think together, to, to think about the piece in the same way so that, you know, the phrase structure is the same, the balance and the blend and the tone quality and the tone color the dynamics are the same, the pacing of the piece, everybody's unified in that sort of thing. I'm teaching students to become not only professional players, but professional teachers. So I don't, I don't approach that ensemble as if I'm the maestro and I just come in and all I have to do is, you know, uh, conduct them and, and uh, everything will be like magic because of my magic gestures. I don't, I don't think that way. Um, I'm trying to get, I'm trying to instill in my students the uh, very professional mindset and habits so that when they go out to teach or when they go out to play or whatever, they don't think about these things. They know how to sit in a re an ensemble and rehearse. They know how to listen in the group and who to listen for and, and what to listen for. The per part of the purpose of this project is to show people who aren't necessarily as involved in the music community and don't understand it as much why music is so significant and how transformative it can be. Um, not even necessarily, not even necessarily just play, playing, but just listening and thinking about it. So could you speak to the significance of music um, to you, to yourself at least, or to your position? Yeah, and I, it, it, it gets kind of personal in a way because, um, you know, I think we all sort of gravitate to things as youngsters that, you know, we're good at, um, that give us pleasure in some way. Um, I was sort of equal part sports and music growing up. Um, and I was a decent athlete, but I was a better musician. I mean, I, I just didn't struggle playing my instrument. It was just easy for me. Um, and so as you, as you develop these, as, as you get engaged in particular kinds of activities, at some point there has to be some reward personally that make you want to continue those activities, if that makes any sense at all. But I think what really made me understand how important it was to me and, um, and made me just want to do this the rest of my life was I had an experience as a freshman at Indiana University. Uh, we had a, a guest composer come in the name of Warren Benson. And uh, Benson had written a piece called The Leaves Are Falling. And it, it's, um, um, I, I will tell you, this piece is not for everybody. Um, for me, it's one of the most significant pieces in our repertoire for a bunch of reasons. But Mr. Benson had been working on a composition 
and he just had a vague idea of what he wanted to do, he, but he was going nowhere with it. He just had some sketches and some notes and things. And, um, and then John Kennedy was killed. And that sort of crystallized his thinking about this piece. And so what he had done so far in the piece was this kind of ethereal, not abstract, but it was just a mood. And I don't know how many measures it was, but it was, you know, a, a decent amount of music. And one of, one of the things that was um, at issue in the 1960 election when Kennedy beat Nixon to become president, one of the things that was used against Kennedy was his Catholicism. You know, a lot of people in this country said, oh, if, if, if a Catholic becomes president, the Pope will run our country and things like that. I know this sounds ancient history at this point to us, but it was definitely a thing at the time. So throughout Kennedy's presidency, when Kennedy died, Benson took one of the great hymns of all faith, um, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Um, and he incorporated that in, in the piece in such, it's a, really a unique way that he did it. Um, you know, not to get too geeky on you, but it's, it's an ABA form. So you have um, a, a, a theme like a different theme and then the same theme again, except for the A and the B theme were, were superimposed in the second half of the piece. So the, the B theme was on top of the return of the A theme. Okay, enough of that. At any rate, so a mighty fortress comes in, in a bunch of different guises throughout this piece. And at the very end, the entire brass section is just thundering away in unison on this, on this theme. And they get to the last note and, and it's just super loud and just penetrating and they're sustaining this note and underneath the brass, the first clarinet player comes in on the same note very quietly. And when the brass cut off, all you hear is the clarinet, solo clarinet dying away for as long as that clarinet player can do that. In those days, at the end of a broadcast day on television, there would always be that tone. And it was very reminiscent of what you heard at the end of this piece. You know, you'd, you'd do the Star Spangled Banner or something, then there would be like this almost dial tone at the end of the day. And it was, it kind of was reminiscent of that to me. At any rate, it was the first experience I had musically that I can point to and say, that was an amazing emotional experience. We got to the end of that piece. We were playing at a national convention in Cincinnati. Mr. Benson was conducting and and because of the lights behind him, I could sort of almost just see him in silhouette. We got to the end of that piece and there was just this deafening silence. Nobody, there were 2000 people or so in that room, nobody moved. They were just so moved by the piece, they, they couldn't respond. And that was 50 something years ago and I still, I, I still get emotional when I talk about it. It's, it's the ability of music to move people whether it's moved people to sadness or to joy or to provoke them to think about things or whatever it is, that's what's so important about it. It's not tunes. Um, it, you know, when I, we, we did a, the last concert we were able to give before the pandemic hit, we played a piece by an African-American composer by the name of Omar Thomas. Omar at the time was teaching at Peabody and he was actually a JMU graduate. He was a drum major at JMU and um, a, a number of years ago. And he wrote this piece called of, of Our New Day Begun. And it's about the massacre in the church in Charleston. And it's built on um, the African-American national anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. It has a similar kind of ending like this where the band is just thundering away on this very simple tune. And underneath it, you hear stomping and clapping like boom, chick, boom, chick. And it's just this, this thunderous roar at the end. And it sort of signifies the African-American experience of, you know, we're in this together, we're, we're not giving up, we're just gonna keep, keep on and keep on and keep on and keep on. And the power of that music, even in every rehearsal, and I'm getting emotional talking about it. <laughs> um, the power of the music, even in rehearsal was just undeniable. We played that piece. And this is literally the last thing I played before we ever, before we shut down. We reached the end of that and it was again the same thing. The audience did not move. They didn't make a sound. 
And I finally, I put my baton down, I stepped off the podium and there's still this absolute stunned silence. I couldn't look at the band, they couldn't look at me. And I thought, you know, I've got to do something to break this. You know, I, I, I can't just pick up the baton and start conducting something. So I walked off stage and I stayed off stage for two or three minutes and there was still this just absolute stunned silence. And, uh, and I walked back on stage, no applause, nothing. I could just hear my footsteps and my heart beating. And we just played a march and we were done. I mean, I just, but we had to do something, you know, you have to get out of that at some point. But there's part of me that thinks if, if we were still there, the audience would still be there. They were just completely transfixed by that piece of music. And that's what keeps me going back. It's not necessarily how it ends. It's just the fact that it does. It's so like that moment, I have a recording of the mo of one of those pieces and it's just so like, it takes you back knowing that you affected someone um, yep. <clears throat> after like all of the frustration of practicing and <laughs> rehearsal, it's so worth it. Well, and you know, the thing that is, is and you read about things like this, um, you know, there's all these things going around Facebook about you know, the 90 something year old ballerina who hasn't communicated with anybody in years and she hears Swan Lake and she starts making all her hand motions from that she did 50 years ago and that sort of thing. And, you know, for me to recount an experience that I had years and years ago, or even months ago in this case, and it still moves me just as much now as it did then. Um, that's pretty powerful. Uh, those musical memories, um, they're unlike a lot of things you do because for one, they're stored in a completely different part of the brain. They're, they're more, um, most of what we do is very immediate and that's sort of left brain stuff. Two plus two is four and you know, Shakespeare wrote books, plays, whatever. Um, but, but the experiential part of your mind, the right side of your brain is just, it's different. We experience things in a different way and therefore we remember them a different way in the same way. Um, my family all were, wanted to go see a show that I really wasn't interested in, but I did want to go see um, um, Beautiful, the Carol King story. And I was sitting up in, in, that, in that theater by myself for, I don't know, a couple hours. And there were about four or five times during that show that I just got very emotional and I have no idea why. But there was something about that music because it was the music of my youth that was conjuring up things that I still to this day don't even know what they were referring me to, but it was super powerful and uh, really annoying to be sitting there sort of feeling emotional around people I didn't know. But I think that that's, that's the real beauty and power of music. And, um, and you always see this in times of national crisis. You pe see people coming together musically in some way, singing some shared song or whatever. So, um, and you will see this as you grow, as you grow older, you will, you will refer back a lot to the songs of your youth, things that were important to you at this time in your life, um, uh, will have a lot more meaning for you later on. You'll hear these songs and it'll dredge up all sorts of memories and experiences and, and feelings. So that's, what's beautiful about it. Yeah, it is. It's such an, an awesome thing. So. As a teacher, what is it like to see students go through this process and experience that moment for the first time? Or like the, the moment that I was thinking of was a few years ago in Greiley when we played Rest. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that was definitely, that was one of the first times where I was like, it was just so, it was such an electric feeling. Well, I will say that since the spring of 1971, it's been my goal to have the, you know, make those kinds of experiences for students, but they're very rare. And you don't know for sure if you've done it until somebody tells you that they've, like, I didn't know you had that memory of rest. Um, it, most time, a lot of times you don't know. And one of the really wonderful things about teaching is students will come up to you 20 years after the fact and say, I'll never forget when you did such and such or said such and such, or when we played such and such or whatever. And I, and I barely can remember it, but to them, it's a very strong, you know, I think, I think there's a, a certain amount of trust we have in this profession that 
at least uh, I guess I should say a hope that we are creating those kinds of things for students. So they're growing musically, emotionally, you know, whatever. There's a maturity going on. And I have to say that, you know, undergraduate, those four years of undergraduate, it's, it's just my favorite time. Uh, I, I think that I love working with undergraduate students and um, I enjoy watching them go through the, the, the process of maturation from 18 to 22 years old. And, um, you know, so, you know, students will come in, you know, thinking they're red hot players only to find out they're, you know, not. And, you know, and, and some of them will go on to graduate schools and they will feel the same thing. They'll feel like, oh, I had a really great college experience. And then they get to a, a, a graduate school experience. And say, oh, wow, man, I didn't know we could do something like this. And it's, it's just a difference. But I, I love I love what I do. I love sharing music with, with students. I love it. I love that moment when you see the lights come on, when you see somebody just have this moment of awareness that they, they didn't have before. And one of the things we were able to do this fall, um, we, we were still able to play, but we had to play in smaller ensembles for, for much smaller, shorter periods of time. But because of that, we didn't have any performances we were, we were perform, we were rehearsing for. So I, I used, a lot of my time is almost like a performance laboratory to really go into depth on a lot of things that a lot of times you just don't have the time to do. And the kind of things that uh, were coming out of those experiences to me were just profound. I was watching students have realization of, of different kinds of detail and different kinds of things they'd never thought about when they played because I did a lot of Q and A with them. So what are you hearing here? What were you thinking about when you did this? And how can we make this better? And all these things where they're having to be very analytical and watching them make that, that pivot from, I just want to get through this piece without embarrassing myself to, Hey, I'm really thinking in depth about my tone quality or my intonation or whatever it happened to be, uh, was really, really rewarding to me that just watching that musical maturity from freshman year through senior, senior, final concert, final recital, or student teaching as the case may be, um, is, is just a rewarding experience for me. I hope for them too. So this is a bit of a pivot, but I've actually been very interested to ask this. So you've mentioned that you have lived in Japan um, and taught. Obviously it's a completely different culture how did music factor into all of that, all of the things that were different? Well, um, you're right. It's just about as different as you can get. Um, there are very few shared experiences. Music, however, is one of them. Literally, we have no shared culture um, or history. So coming together uh, uh, musically is something that we all enjoy. And it's, it's really magical in a way. Um, because I can walk into rehearsal and not, I mean, I really, I know maybe 10 or 15 phrases and words and things and, and, and even fewer, um, um, kanji and things. I mean, it's, 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 it's mind-blowingly difficult, but, um, but I can go into a rehearsal and through the process of using, um, through singing through diagramming on a, on a board, through um, using Italian words, uh, because, you know, of course that's in their music. Um, you know, it is, it's slower because the process of communication is, is much less precise in some ways. Um, but you can, you know, when, you, when, when it starts to come together, uh, it's, it's, it's just magical. And it, one of the things that fascinates me the school that I teach at there is sort of considered the Juilliard of Tokyo. Just to give you a sense of how different it is, when I walk through the halls there, I, I rarely, rarely ever get a chance to open a door for myself. Everybody is constantly bowing to me about everything uh, to the point where, um, well, uh, what I'm called over there is sensei, Austin sensei. And sensei is like, teacher but it, there's layers and layers of respect and everything on top of that it's it's it doesn't translate very well but um senseis don't make mistakes whether you make a mistake or not it wasn't your mistake and i've made many mistakes in rehearsal and i, I would you know try to own up to my mistake and 
people just shake their heads like, no, 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 it's me. I, I, I made a mistake, you know, that sort of thing. And um, uh, in fact, at one, one time I was trying to explain to the man that I was making a mistake and I was pointing to myself. And um, until I had somebody translate it, most of the bands thought I was saying, watch me. <laughs> but um, one of the things that's very interesting to me about working over there um, is that the students over there are no, not any more innately talented than our students are. However, it's been very, very rare that I would ever see a student here give as much effort and they would work as hard as those students do because a mantra in Japan is, I know you will do your best. And that's just not words to them. Yes, I will do my best. I'll do the very best I can. And to the point where, you know, we could be at intermission at our, at our concert and they would still be backstage practicing for the second half of the concert because they wanted to make it better than they thought it was in the last rehearsal or whatever. And that to me is really intimidating. Um, it makes me feel like there's nothing I can do to work hard enough to earn the kind of work that they're giving me back. Um, it's a really fascinating process and a fascinating experience. And I've, I've, I've now spent about a year of my life over there one time or another um, working in Tokyo. The feeling of doing that and creating something that is so instantaneous, is such like an amazing feeling. And then listening and knowing what's going behind that makes, I think makes it easier to enjoy music. Obviously with all of the technology that is being created, there has definitely been a, a loss, a little bit at least, a loss of interest in what we do. So how do you think we take this up to bring people in and show them what an amazing process it is and how emotionally profound it can be and effective? Well, I think, I don't know if there's a way you can, you can guarantee that. Um, one thing that you can do is perform music for one that actually says something that actually creates some kind of feeling of some sort. Doesn't have to be the same feeling. One of the things that's really interesting about music is I could play a piece for you. I could play for 10 people in a room and I can say, how does this make you feel? And you're going to get a lot of sort of similar responses but you're never gonna get, this makes me hate the world and this makes me wanna go get a puppy. You're not gonna get those kinds of different responses. You're gonna get you know, something on the sad response or the love response or the happy response or something, but different words. So we can't guarantee that people are gonna have some sort of, I don't know, emotional is maybe not exactly the right word, but it is kind of, I mean, you can have really emotional responses to music. But you can guarantee that that won't happen if you play music that's just trivial and, and doesn't create any kind of sense of um, any kind of feeling uh, with it. And the composer wasn't trying to say anything. They were just trying to sell a piece that lasted six and a half minutes long that could be played by a grade four band. So um, that's the um, that's kind of the short answer. And, and the other the other part of it is, is I think when, when you're performing a piece of music, if you're not heavily invested in that piece and you're not giving everything you have to, to really get that message across, then there's no way that the audience, it's not their responsibility. You know, that's your responsibility as a player. It's such an enigma because, I mean, if you really think hard about, I've done this before, and if you really think hard about music, it's just pitches. No one has the answer to why that change in a chord can make you feel something. And I think that's very interesting. It is, but, but think about this just for a second, because I always hear this music as a universal language thing, and it really isn't. Um, music is part of a particular culture. And I'll give you an example. One of the things that fascinates me um, when I'm living in Tokyo is to hear anybody playing on playing traditional Japanese instruments and playing traditional Japanese songs. And it doesn't mean a thing to me. It's just sounds. It's fascinating, but it's just sounds. So the idea of 
minor being sad and major being happy for us is a learned thing. It's part of our culture, but you could do the same thing for most cultures that are not steeped in Western music traditions. And you don't have that. Do you think that's kind of, I mean, obviously we do have great music resources, but there isn't as much of a passion for um, classical era music in the United States as compared to in Vienna. There is definitely a difference. And do you think that's because we don't have a whole lot of music that is um, that is from that era that, era that is American? I, I think there's a lot of things at play. And, and, and let me just go back to Tokyo for a second. In December in Tokyo, there'll be like 25 performances with different orchestras and choirs of Beethoven 9. And they'll all be sold out all over town. That's not part of their culture at all, but they've learned to really appreciate it, really love it. Um, and I remember when the Richmond Symphony was on strike years and years ago, and I was talking to somebody in the symphony, I don't remember who it was. I, they, I think they were concerned that the public wouldn't support them and that they, you know, they would just be left to hang out to dry or whatever. And I said, well, I, I see that as a, as a failure of American music education when that happens, because somehow we've taken the study of music and turned it into an activity. And I don't mean that in a really pejorative way, but there is no subject called band. Band isn't a subject. Music is a subject. Band is a way to encounter music, but we very often get completely tied up in the skills part of it and we don't get to the point where we're teaching people about music or attitudes about music like that are sort of lifelong but no i can't live without listening to music even you know that sort of thing and that's and that's because it hasn't been a priority in this country when you and you, you mentioned the fact that you know in this country does we american music didn't really exist that much for a long time and because you know when the when the um, Puritans came over here. Um, they spent the first hundred and something years just trying to survive. You know, the idea of having an opera house or something was just, it, you know, that's, you know, why would we do that? We just want to feed our families and, you know, build buildings and build cities and uh, get ourselves to the West Coast as soon as possible, whatever. And um, so it, you know, there was music, there was certainly music, but it was the majority of what you heard and the majority of what's remains from the historical record is stuff that was transplanted from, from Europe. But it was a long time before uh, the average person could hear a symphony orchestra. And so even in the early part of the 20th century, many people who heard the music of say Wagner and Tchaikovsky heard it from the touring professional concert bands. They weren't hearing it for professional orchestras because the professional orchestras were in Boston and in Chicago and New York, Pittsburgh maybe. Their, their whole exposure to that music, and that was before recordings, um, might've been hearing the Sousa band play a transcription. And it wasn't until those things became available sort of on a, a, a lot, much larger scale that there was even that kind of an opportunity you know, for people to become musically educated and familiar with certain kinds of, you know, the great works or whatever. So. That's such an interesting answer. Um, you've definitely blown my mind several times within the last hour. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, it's awesome. I am, um, I don't want to keep you too long because I've held you for a little over the time that we allotted, but um, I just want to thank you for taking the time to speak with me. Um, this was really awesome. I would really, really, really look forward to that. And thanks for reaching out to me too, Camille. I really, really enjoyed this conversation with you. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I enjoyed interviewing. Please, again, leave me questions, comments, concerns in the form or in the comment section. I really love to hear from you, interact with you, what you learned, and create a community around it. If you have any suggestions on how to improve, let me know. Stay tuned.